Welcome to Iceland and feel free to join me as I visit a small Icelandic town by the north coast, only 70 kilometers away from the Arctic Circle. And uh, as always we start the journey on a map and uh, dive into Siglufjörður, surrounded by steep mountains on the Troll Peninsula, as we wonder why did my forefathers build a town around here. But first we ask what Icelanders think of when Siglufjörður is mentioned. And the answer is the Herring Uprise, the Herring Downfall, and decades later the Uprise as one of the most interesting tourist destinations in Iceland. But we also think about uh, difficult roads, road tunnels, mountains and spectacular nature. But uh, let's start at the beginning. The early history of the town is shrouded in secrecy due to isolation, which uh, made the town a kind of symbol for disobedience to the Danish authorities. But Iceland was for a long time controlled by the Danish crown and uh, until the late 18th century we were under the shackles of the Danish Icelandic trade monopoly or since 1602. That meant that the people of Siglufjörður were obliged to direct their trade to Akureyri, the capital of northern Iceland, but the isolated Siglufjörður took the opportunity to trade with the English, the Germans, the Dutch, or just any ship that passed by, because it was so hard for the Danes to keep an eye on the villages, since the only chance to get to them was by ship. So the locals would do things their own way, like buy alcohol from the foreign ships and even resell it in Reykjavik for profits. But it wasn't a big town back then though, and hardly even a town. The early settlement was on this small peninsula by the mouth of the fjord, and it was a shark hunting community, and the origins of that settlement can be traced back to the 11th century. It was the proximity to the fishing grounds that kept people there, but after a great storm where the settlement was flooded, boats and houses were destroyed and many drowned, the settlement began to move into the fjord where the town stands today. But the big event that was to mark the town for all time to come was the arrival of the Norwegians in 1903. They had been whale hunting close by since the late 18th century, but this time they came after the herring and uh, they brought new types of uh, fishing equipment and taught Icelanders to go after the silver of the ocean, as the herring was often called, and the Klondike of the north became a reality. Every bit of land in Siglifjörður was used under piers and factories, and the Norwegians got the best locations as they led the way, and uh, many of them would settle there permanently. So Siglifjörður changed from a village with the one muddy street, with turf houses into the most uh, international town in Iceland, where in 1911 in total 23 bars could be found in town. The turf houses disappeared to make way for more modern buildings built for the herring profit, and Siglufjörður became also the worst smelling town in the world, since the herring was not only salted, but uh, also used to make fish meal and fish oil, so, in addition, the town got the reputation of being the ugliest town in the country. But the pollution from the factories was not all bad, since it was always a fish meal in the air, and people say that the mountain slopes around the town turned green during those years, because fish meal is of course a good fertilizer, and the hills are still green today. And uh, like in Klondike, life was all about work and when people were not working, they were often having fun. So Siglufjörður got the worst uh, reputation a town can get. When the weather was bad and many ships in port, it could be as many as 12, 14,000 people in the town. And when this incredible number of opportunistic uh, fishermen from different nations came together in a town where uh, there were 10 times more men than women, there were often fights, and uh, no ordinary fights. <laughs> After the Act of Union signed in 1918, Iceland was recognized as a fully sovereign state, and as a result we gained uh, control over our fishing, and Norwegian factories were replaced with Icelandic factories in the years to come. And uh, the town developed fast, so in 1920 there were over 20 retail stores in town, a bakery, coffee shops, bars, 
where illegal alcohol sales flourished. Facilities for migrant workers were often disastrous, but people still came to work because it was better to have money than not. And the workers, who previously were stuck in a system of slavedom on farms, had the chance to work for cash for the first time in their lives, as they also found independence and self-esteem. But we have to bear in mind that Iceland back then didn't have so much to offer. Workforce on farms were not paid, but worked for food and housing, so they were in fact enslaved. And this was actually so bad that farmers could send their workers to work in fish by the shore, where they lived often in disgusting sea camps, only to come back to hand over the wages to their husbands. And those same farmers were losing their workforce rapidly. People could finally get paid in cash, so they didn't complain over the herring smell. In fact, the smell from fish meal factories has always been called the smell of money here in Iceland, ever since. Other herring factories sprang up all over the country, but Siglufjörður was always the herring capital, with up to nine herring factories in operation at the time, and the permanent population exceeded 3,000 in the 1950s, and the total length of the piers in town was over seven kilometers. And it is really amazing to see all the business activities at that time, but there was a printing press in town that printed books and magazines like Tarzan and Superman, and they even had four local newspapers. The pharmacist opened up a soft drink factory which would later move to Akureyri and become the basis for the largest beer factory in Iceland today, and there was even a furniture factory in town. But the wealth had its own price tag. One of the factories was hit by an avalanche in 1919, killing nine, but it was located on the other side of the fjord, and since then it has never been built there, or where those remains can still be seen. But overall this is a period that is looked at with a certain romance today, and the romance was there for sure, despite the hard work. The herring season was an inspiration for painters, photographers, musicians, and their work would later become a part of the cultural history of Iceland. And the herring girl was always the center of attention, but the hardship that came with the job was not always visible through the footage, nor in the music that still lives on. But let's move to transportation, an important part of the town's history, and I want to remind you that I have another video online covering the neighboring town Olafsfjörður. But the stories of those two towns were to be united by tunnels, but first let's take a look at the obstacles. The town is surrounded by high and steep mountains, and at first it was only possible to go there by sea. There was a horse trail through a mountain pass above the town, and according to old tales, the mountain ridge was so narrow that it was possible to sit on it and rest your legs in two separate counties. That obstacle was broken down so horses could go through, but it wasn't until 1942 when road construction started and it would be the first road to Siglufjörður, or shortly before the herring adventure peaked. The first car made it through in 1945, but the road wasn't opened for general traffic until 1948. But it was only opened during summers since the elevation was over 600 meters and the mountain ridge had to be lowered by 14 meters to get the cars through. This was a horrible road, but the only option back then. But later on the idea arose to make tunnels through a mountain north from town to end the isolation permanently. The road tunnels would open in 1967, 800 meters long and single span, but even though it's short tunnels by Icelandic standards today, it was a huge project, and the technology of making them was extremely primitive and certainly not according to today's safety requirements. The tunnels are still in full use, but the road is a subject to restrictions due to the fact that the road is moving. It's moving down with the hillside, so they want uh, new tunnels, but uh, I'm not seeing that happen in the near future, since we can only do so much. And they did get the new road tunnels, not one, but two of them, in 2010, one of the biggest road constructions uh, in Iceland, 
when uh, two tunnels between Siglufjörður and neighboring Ólasjörður opened up. Through this uh, remote fjord and opened the road between Akureyri and Siglufjörður through three tunnels in total, including the tunnels connecting Ólasjörður and Eyjafjörður. But before we explore that part of the story, let's start with the collapse of the herring industry. It was between 1960 and 1970 that it became clear that the glory days were over as the herring stock collapsed and the town entered a period where it became only a monument, monument of greed to some, and the decaying piers and factories became a symbol of uh, unsustainable uh, optimism and the consequences were even worse for the national treasury. Many moved to the Reykjanes Peninsula to work uh, on the NATO base as uh, Icelandic economy was collapsing during a period of uh, inflation and uh, instability and the uh, remains from the herring collapse can still be found in towns all over the country in the form of uh, old factories where once was life but no more. Many local people experienced this as a certain uh, humiliation as the town was to suffer for the decades to come. But uh, that would all change into a new resurrection in 1991 when a new annual uh, town festival was held for the first time, finally celebrating the herring years. A herring museum was established in one of the old factories and the festival was for a long time one of the largest uh, town festivals in Iceland. And after the tunnels to Ólasvörður opened in 2010, those two towns, Ólasvörður and Siglifjörður, would merge into one municipality and the travel time between them would shorten down to 20 minutes from over two hours during winters. And it was immediately clear that the people of Siglifjörður intended to use every opportunity from a tunnel project to the fullest, while things were slower at the Ólasvörður side. And it was a private enterprise that had everything to do with it, but a local businessman who had uh, prospered in business came home with the profits and started to build up uh, tourist infrastructure on a large scale. The town image started to change again, and so did the smell because the new smell of money came from the new restaurants. And to make this simple, the town has flourished ever since and mostly due to this uh, one businessman who not only used his wealth to build a hotel and restaurants, but also a biotechnology company that uh, attracts uh, well-educated people who before had no chance of getting a job elsewhere than in the city or abroad. So that is Siglufjörður today. And the town story is such a good sample of how things can turn around without taxpayers' money. And to compare the newly connected towns is like comparing black and white in a way. But again, you can see that better in my video about Ólasjörður, but I recommend that you take a look at that one too, to understand this region better. It has proved to be a major problem for Icelanders to maintain settlements in sparsely populated areas, and there are quite a few voices that say it's simply too expensive. And they are right to a certain extent, but the fundamental question is always, what kind of country do we want to live in? And uh, when I come to Siglufjörður on a beautiful summer day, while the town is full of tourists who are enjoying the history of Iceland in its uh, original environment, I see that everything is possible indeed. But the initiative has to come from the locals and the money. And it's also a big decision to make a town go through such changes, since uh, some of us like uh, the privacy of our smaller communities better than the tourist traffic. But uh, in relation to the development of the population, it remains the same or around 1200 people. But at the other end of the tunnels in Ólasjörður, it has declined, mainly because they did not go after the tourism like they did in Siglufjörður. But then we need to look at other factors, such as the low winter sun. But in Siglufjörður, you won't even see the sun from November 15th to January 28th. And uh, snowy winters are not for all, but the risk of avalanches here has been reduced a lot because after an extremely tragic event in the Westfjords where 30 people died due to avalanches in one year, Icelanders had to reconsider the risk of avalanches in many villages and since then a number of defense structures have been built 
and it's a project that's still ongoing. Siglufjörður was one of the first towns to receive those defenses and fortunately they were well designed to fit into the landscape. So new vegetation hides the lower structures but higher up in the mountain there are steel frames that are clearly visible as we fly over them and we can see very well the risk that used to hang over the town but that threat is no more. And the snow isn't all bad of course. It is no coincidence that over 50% of the youth here goes skiing on a regular basis, but the ski facilities are in a valley inside the fjord, but in January 2021 an avalanche destroyed a house up there that was used by skiers, but I was up there few months later trying to drive the old road that's only open during summers, but this year we had to back out since it was still much snow there in June. But it is one of my favorite uh, roads in Iceland. And on the whole, it is a definite defense victory that I see in this rough and uh, sparsely populated area or to have been able to maintain the town population through the last decades. But the tourist industry is a big factor of course and the town that used to be by the end of the highway is now by the highway and it's a part of a tourist concept that we call the Arctic Coastway or a route that spans 900 kilometers, or the complete north coast of Iceland that's possible to drive now. And the road's theme is diversity, and it's also a good tool to distribute tourist traffic more around the country, because many of the hottest areas in the south are often overcrowded with tourists, while business elsewhere could be much better. And a part of a good visit to Iceland should be to sense the wilderness, go berry picking on a mountain that you have for yourself for a while, watch the northern lights where there is no light pollution, and overall breathe in the nature, wilderness and history. And this landscape and this town is still an inspiration for artists, but the 2015 TV series Trapped that has been distributed worldwide was filmed almost entirely in Siglifjörður, and the second series as well, so the so-called movie location tourism is also on the rise. But the town offers more than nature, history and a movie set. There are numerous galleries, workshops, museums in town, and of course a swimming pool, sauna, gym and a golf course. It's possible to camp in the town or around the town. And I just love how much the town has to offer. Not just uh, hot dogs and uh, a lame museum set up with uh, government funding, but uh, that's all you can see in many of our smaller communities. Siglufjörður is simply a good community. And I'm ending this today by telling you about uh, one of the many monuments in town, or this one, but it's a statue of a man called uh, Gusti Guðsmaður, or uh, Gusti, the man of God. Virtually all the money he earned during his long life as a fisherman was donated to children around the world. He sacrificed everything for his mission and trusted in his lord for safety at sea in all weathers. So I'm linking to more info in English about him because he's a part of the town's soul and it's easy to feel the gratitude from the locals when his name is mentioned. But this was the story of Siglifjörður, a thriving community close by the Arctic Circle, a community of stubborn people who learned to live around those mountains. And on my behalf, it's a highly recommended tourist destination, just as all the Arctic coast road. And I will continue my journey around Iceland with a new episode soon, and please consider to subscribe to support my work since this series will span all Icelandic towns by time, with the hope that it's not only educating, but helpful when it comes to make the most out of your own trip to my home country, Iceland.